Well, hello, hello, and thank you so much for joining us on this Road to GEC event as we talk about uh, challenges and opportunities for regional enterprises, regional entrepreneurs uh, in uh, rural communities outside of the metro areas. My name is Chad Renando. I'm the Managing Director for the Global Entrepreneurship Network here in Australia and also a research fellow with the University of Southern Queensland's Rural Economy Center of Excellence and Director for Startup Status, where we're mapping and measuring the innovation ecosystem in Australia. And I'm here with an amazing panel to have a bit of a yarn with us around what are these challenges and opportunities. Um, before we start, I do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all on. I'm here um, broadcasting from Yagara Country, uh, Yagara Country uh, just outside of Brisbane in Queensland, um, and uh, pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and those who might be watching this and, and joining us uh, are definitely an important part of this conversation. Um, so, by setting up a bit of the context on these Road to GEC events, what we're doing is we're preparing for the Global Entrepreneurship Congress, which is going to be in Melbourne from the 19th to the 22nd of September. Um, and during that time, we're going to be having conversations around what are the core challenges and opportunities that are available to us to transform our world as we work towards building one global entrepreneur ecosystem across a range of focus areas. And one of those focus areas is around regional and rural entrepreneurship. Because we know there's a lot of challenges there that maybe the, the metro cities uh, don't face. And a few weeks back, we had a conversation with some leaders around this very topic. And we had a whole list of, of themes around challenges, such as lack of funding and lack of ecosystem support, such as networks and mentors, lack of access to markets uh, and uh, internet connectivity and lack of density. Challenges specific to youth or First Nations or, or women that, that are exasperated by being in regional communities that they may not experience in, in the city centers. We also heard heaps around opportunities, such as how do we double down and focus on the strengths of the community, such as the sector like agriculture and, and ag tech and, and leverage the strengths of the livability within the community and the, the bond that you can quite often have in a, in a rural or regional area. Well, that's all good, almost in the in the high level abstract. But what does that look like in a given region? And here, as we look at the leaders around the Zoom, we're seeing people that have that in depth lived experience in Central Victoria, in rural and regional, and not just within Australia, but from a global perspective as well, from their businesses, from their travels, uh, from their scaling as as entrepreneurs, from from their their global view on the economy and finance. It's a really just honored to be able to be on a Zoom screen with, with uh, these amazing people. And so to, to introduce them to you, wherever you're, you're listening from, whatever time, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Let's have a bit of a conversation. Let's understand more around these challenges. Now, to do this, I'm going to ask each of our panelists three questions. First, who are you and what do you do? Pretty basic one. Second, when you think about the challenges and opportunities facing entrepreneurs and regional communities, just in a maybe in a, a two or three minute pitch, what would you say they are from your experience, just at a very high level? And third, if you were to describe doing something entrepreneurial in a rural or regional community as a vehicle, what vehicle would that be? Is it a rocket ship? And just absolutely taking off and accelerating? Is it, is it like fairly new and, and up and coming, like an electric vehicle? Is it kind of plodding along like an old pair of tennis shoes? Is it floating around like a cloud or a hang glider or a parachute? Is it kind of bumping along like a bike or an old jalopy? What is your vehicle in terms of how you would describe rural entrepreneurship from your perspective? So who, are, who you are and what you do, a bit of the round of the challenge and opportunities and what is that vehicle? Carrie, we'll kick off with you. Thanks, Chad. Uh, great to be with you and our audience again. Um, I'm Kerry Anderson, and my role is to head up Startup Centre Victoria. We're very lucky in Victoria to have a number of regional programs that are being run by amazing people, and uh, with the aim of building up the uh, collaborative ecosystem that is our role and where many of us are funded by LaunchVic, some are by councils. 
uh, private companies. And I'm fortunate that I have a consortium, a mix of um, private companies and public companies and local government that are committed to this process. Do you want me to keep going with the other questions? Oh, yeah, thank you. other questions as well. Okay. The challenges. All right. Uh, we did a, a digital um, survey last year. Um, Startup Centre Victoria helped to commission that through the City of Greater Bendigo. And one thing that really struck me was the lack of talent in the region uh, in terms of digital tech. And looking at the universities and the programs that they're offering to the regions is a problem. Uh, it's always directed back to the city. So that to me was a big surprise because entrepreneurs need talent to grow their companies. And if we're not getting that digital tech input, uh, that is really a big thing. Another thing that I've noticed when I interview entrepreneurs, and this is Australia wide, a big difference between entrepreneurs here in a rural context and overseas, what I've observed in the States, is that we're not as collaborative. Uh, you know, great idea, passion, done the research, got that um, calculated risk-taking appetite, but they're not so good. Um, they're trying to hold it close. And that's where they hit a lot of problems in the, the scaling up. So that's an observation I've noticed. And But they may have a great idea, but it doesn't reach its full potential because of this. And, and perhaps that's part of our population. We're not as dense a population. So I see our role as uh, programs is to try and join those dots and bring those people together and, and match them up with the sources that can help take them further into the, the next realm. And um, a vehicle, a vehicle. I'm getting to the chase and I have first dibs on this. I reckon, my, my, you put this to us just before we start, Chad, highly unfair, I think, but what popped into mind first was a good old Holden Ute. Because I've just said to you, one of the challenges is we need to be more collaborative as entrepreneurs. So the entrepreneurs will, they're so innovative, they'll take that old Holden Ute out of the paddock, they'll tinker with it, they'll get it going, they've got an idea to modify it. But as they go past all their neighbours, they need to pull on the digital tech talent, they need to pull on the investor, they need to pull on. Um, so with the Ute, a good old Holden Ute, I reckon, that they can fit lots of collaborative people that are going to help them um, get right up where they deserve to be in a global market. How does that sound? Yeah, perfect, Carrie. Thanks for that. Yeah, and, and some of those challenges I'm sure will, will resonate as, as we go through and, and, and speak with the others. The lack of talent, uh, lack, lack of collaboration, you know, speaking of that population density, you know, and, and that need for that connectivity. And I love that that notion of the holding you with with everything kind of hanging off and, and putting on it to, to make it better. That's good. So Craig, uh, we're going to hop over to you. Uh, and again, who you are, what you do, uh, some of the challenges that you see and opportunities, and um, what's your vehicle? Thanks, Chad, and thanks for the opportunity um, to be able to be part of this initiative. It's um, really exciting, and we're looking forward to having the Global Entrepreneurs Congress in Victoria. Um, I'm located in Bendigo, Central Victoria, and um, I'm the Director of Government Engagement for Clear Dynamics and Clear Dynamics is uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, enterprise software provider. Uh, we provide some of the largest organisations in Australia with their everything from originations to workflow through to customer portals and um, and more obscure things like collateralised debt obligations and fraud case management. Literally everything that an enterprise requires. Um, and one of the um, unique opportunities I've had is to uh, be a, a leader of community networks. Um, and, you know, I would probably say that one of the opportunities uh, within regional Australia or, or any region, in fact, is that you have enterprise organisations within regions. And those enterprise organisations are far more accessible than enterprise organisations in your capital cities or your global um, uh, organizations. 
And so there's a great opportunity there through networking to develop strong relationships with C-suite that you would run into in regional networking events. Um, and we prototyped this um, uh, nearly 10 years ago uh, in our business and it enabled us to develop strong relationships with organizations like the Bendigo Bank and uh, the Bendigo Healthcare Organization through to the, the, the Bendigo Telco and, and, a, and a broader range of enterprise organizations that enables you as a startup to move to that scale up mode and understand what's required as a startup to transition to being a scale up. And I noticed one of the comments in the feedback in preparation for these sessions was, you know, fail fast and fail small. And that's the opportunity that you've got within the regions to be able to build a relationship with enterprises, find out what you don't know very quickly. It's one thing to have worked in an enterprise. It's another thing to work for and deliver to enterprises. One of the, um, one of the difficulties in, in being in a region is not having an ecosystem uh, or, and, and in fact, in, in some cases, needing to build the ecosystem of your industry up around you. Uh, you know, and that can be a really significant challenge because you need to attract talent um, and it becomes a bit of a chicken or the egg situation. So, you know, that's something that as, as getting a superpower of being a networker then enables you to be able to not just build the relationships to get an introduction into enterprise organisations to help your organisation go from startup to scale up. But it also, that networking helps you start to be involved and be proactive in building uh, that ecosystem. And, and of course, this is all happening while you're trying to run a business. And that's one of the other great challenges that you, you have to wear so many hats. And I would say because of that, the vehicle um, would definitely be a four-wheel drive because you are having to change gears a lot. You are, I reckon I might have stolen Poland. Uh, you sometimes wind up driving through rivers and you 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 go from being a, a vehicle to something that's more amphibious. Um, you sometimes find yourself leaping from, you know, one side of a chasm to the other and needing to get a run up. And so you're almost flying uh, or you're getting airborne over bumps um, and you've got to be able to change tires on the go and deal with your motor blowing up. And yeah, it's, it's uh, quite, an, it's an adventure vehicle. Craig, I love it. And I loved how you described yourself as I'm a leader of community networks, which I think really just epitomizes a lot of what you're talking about. Um, and, and also just maybe the flip side of, of picking up on um, that opportunity of getting into some of those enterprise companies in smaller communities, I, I would imagine it's also the need for trust um, in order to build those relationships and trust um, first off. Uh, and, and as you say, to, to be able to work with them to overcome some of the challenges that Carrie was saying as far as um, the talent and lack of talent. And and I do love your vehicle um, as far as, again, just the diversity and having a having to wear so many hats. And people quite often say jack of all trades, master of none, but it's almost like you got to be a, a jack of all trades and a master of many cars. Master like, of them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. At different that's times right. and sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um. And um, welcome to uh, those who are just joining us. It looks like we're having a, a bit of a global audience here, people all the way from the Caribbean and obviously from from uh, from Australia and from regions there. Uh, definitely a, a global challenge that we're, we're talking about here. Um, Colin, we're going to uh, pass on to you. And so again, love to hear who you are, what you do, um, some of the challenges that you see and opportunities within regional communities and uh, what's your vehicle. Well, I might start with a vehicle first and hello everyone, because um, I've been inspired by Craig and by Kerry. And my vehicle is a four-wheel drive Tesla Ute, right? For all of the reasons that Kerry's described from everybody getting on board in terms of Craig having a, an all-terrain vehicle that can navigate the bumps along the way. But for me, one of the great transformations that's happening at the moment in society and indeed communities right around, well, indeed right around uh, Australia, regional rural communities, is this transformation from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And I think it's something that each community will need to get a handle on. And, and I think it provides great opportunities for communities also to see how they collectively get um, involved in this transformation. You know, it's, it's one of those things. And if you, if you overlay that 
with a digital transformation that's also occurring and probably it's probably been accelerated through the pandemic, hasn't it? Um, and created opportunities in rural and regional areas where people can actually um, uh, work where they live rather than live where they work. So in a way, I think that the, the Tesla with the four-wheel drive and the ute pretty much describes that energy transformation, the digitisation, if you like, and the opportunities that creates for us. I think the challenge from, from uh, and I work for the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, uh, Bendigo Bank is uh, is located here in central Victoria in Bendigo. It has its origins in the gold fields. Uh, it was started by the citizens of Bendigo who were looking to get out of tents and into houses. And so there's been a long and proud history of actually um, feeding into the prosperity of communities. About 20 odd years ago, um, the bank developed a new model called community banking, which is essentially a community enterprise. And what that does is it allows communities to have uh, their own bank, if you like, but also derive the benefits of the revenues that come from the profits of that bank and from the profits invest those revenues back into things that community cares about. Um, so um, essentially it's a community enterprise with a, a purpose of investing back into community. So it gives them the opportunity to invest in the ecosystem to identify, to nurture and to support local entrepreneurs. So I would say the challenge for rural and regional communities is how do you actually provide that environment where people, where that human capital can rise to the surface, it can be nurtured, it can be supported, and, um, and it can be part of the next generation of community builder as well as business builder. Awesome. Thanks for that, Colin. I, I love that mix and absolutely, like, it, it's almost impossible to have these conversations without talking about that decarbonization, the new platforms that are being created, like the new the new energy infrastructure, which is a lot of unknowns, but a lot of opportunities. Um, and as you say, working with Bendigo Bank, I also love that notion of tapping into the innovative nature. I like, I like how you, you told the story of Bendigo Bank from an innovative platform that they developed over time uh, and this new model that they have, which 20 years ago when it came up with would have been just a whole new way of thinking. Um, and so how does how do the entrepreneurs and startups then work with the innovative opportunities and corporates? That's good. Thank you. Um, Alex, so as we're all talking, you know, we're, we're hearing from, you know, Craig, who's into AI, but when working with a lot of corporates, uh, Carrie, who's in some ecosystem building, Colin, who's, you know, in the, in the banking sector and finance can see things, and you're an entrepreneur, giving it a go, <laughs> giving a startup. I'd love to yeah. hear more about you and... Um, yeah, challenged opportunities that you're facing and uh, what's your vehicle? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. My name's Alex. I am an engineer and also founder of a company called Milk Drop, which uh, is working on making breast pumps a lot more comfortable for women who have to use them. So if, I don't know if anyone's come across these before, but for every 10 women who use a breast pump, uh, six have nipple pain and seven say they feel like a cow. And um, it's it's a problem I experienced when I, you know, you know, became a mum for the first time four years ago. And ever since then, I've been trying to sort of use my skills to try to improve that, which is where the engineering comes in. Um, I think, uh, you know, the challenges that I see for the regions are actually probably one of um, misunderstanding or not enough imagination. I've been absolutely blown away by how inventive, clever, innovative people are in the regions. And I think there's this tendency to sort of um, have a very um, uh, old view of it or may maybe just the wrong view of it, which is it's just agriculture, horses, big wide plains, and that's absolutely not what it's about in, in the country. Um, it may not be as dense, but... There are lots of very interesting people doing very interesting, some of them quite high tech things. Um, and so I think what you lack coming from the city, you know, I've, I've lived in both. Yes, there's no ecosystem. <clears throat> it's very hard to get people with the exact skill that you need as the founder. Um, it's not a particularly dense ecosystem, but what it makes up uh, what it lacks in that it makes up for in these really broad, super integrated communities. So everybody knows each other and everybody can help in a certain way. And I think as a founder, 
that's a really good uh, thing to be able to draw from. So you're not only drawing advice from people in the startup community, you're drawing advice from general business owners, from people who run the council, from people who have big farms, like everybody's got something to contribute to building businesses. And it's sort of less funneled into this kind of startup vibe, startup culture, which I really appreciate. Um, I think, um, so yeah, that access to business and access to councils and access to people to try your ideas out and, you know, get feedback and that kind of thing has been really good. Uh, in terms of vehicles, I don't know. I, I can't really think of anything that I, I guess maybe you could tell me I'm thinking about something that is um, remarkably innovative, but overlooked, you know, something that's getting the job done. I remember my dad used to drive around this like little Honda city. It's like a tiny little box on wheels in the eighties and it got him to work and home every day for 20 years. It did the job. It was, you know, probably quite remarkable in terms of its engineering, but it was really nothing crazy to look at. And I think that's sort of where, um, you know, what I've noticed having moved here in the last couple of years. No, I love that, Alex. Um, and so many things to pick up on in that, in that, especially when you talk to regional entrepreneurs, the story you share is, is so similar. And people say, I had this problem. I applied yeah. my strengths. I'm now solving this problem. Yeah and I'm scaling it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easier said than done, right? Like, I mean, one of the big uh, sort of crushing things I had to learn was that designing the um, solution was, you know, like one hundredth of the um, effort to building a business. Um, and so I've had to kind of transition from being a designer and an engineer to actually learning how to run and build and try to scale a business. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd say that that's been the biggest challenge, but it, it, it's not that we don't have uh, support in the regions to do that. There's plenty of it. I guess there's that kind of like incidental thing that you don't sort of get as much here. So, you know, all of those events that get run, like I'm part of a lot of, you know, women in women in startups and women in STEM and all of those kinds of things, you don't... Um, have access to those more specialised, well, they shouldn't be specialised, but those specialised kind of areas that, you know, they're always held in the cities. Um, when COVID was happening, it was awesome because you could access anything anywhere, but that's kind of died down a little bit now. And so I think like your ability to maybe fundraise and to network in niche areas is harder. But um, as Craig was saying, like your ability to network and access in your own town is just phenomenal. I mean, people people take you seriously the minute they meet you. There's not like five layers of management to get through to approve a tiny pilot project or anything like that. I think you can just kind of talk to whoever you need. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I want to maybe shift our conversation because we've gone through, I've got heaps of notes on um, and more so questions on practically than how do we solve that? Like how, how do we develop ideas and solutions that collectively globally which would be probably shared by the people uh, watching this, we, we can start addressing some of those. Um, and it's interesting your car, because the thought I had as you're describing it is, is kind of like the an inspector gadget car or Chitty Chitty yeah. Bang Bang, where you look at it, it's unassuming, but man, you sing that song and the wings come out and it starts doing yeah. stuff that you're like, oh my God, how could it do that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good, that's a good idea. I feel like you've played this game before, Chad. Twice. <laughs> so the, the, um, so, Let's let's then maybe go go to the go to the group and we can start asking that and, and people in the chat feel please feel free to, to throw your your thoughts and I want to look at that one first maybe on um because I know that that Alina's in the in the audience at the moment and you know sort of shake has been doing some good stuff obviously Carrie with the, with the startup center Victoria um these collaborative bodies how do we do that better when I was working in one of the regions up in Queensland we actually calculated the extra cost for an entrepreneur to be regional there's a regional tax you know, to be able to find that service provider, to find that accountant, to find that manufacturer, to go the three tries, whereas in the city, you can get those three tries a lot faster because it's denser, like maybe from your personal experience and maybe from some of the others, um, how do we address the the digital or social systems to compensate for the lack of the physical systems that we take for, for granted in the city? There's something there, Chad, that... Um... Um, I've noticed uh, in the whatever it's 15 years that I've been running um, 
startups to scale ups within regional centres. And one of the things that we don't do well, and that I think there's value to be learned irrespective of what region you're in, and it comes to policy, and whether it's policy from a business networking perspective, collaborating with government, state and local government, and or federal, is being more explicit about the pathway that a startup takes to scale up. We provide a lot of support for startups and you know, mentoring sessions and innovation. Clear Dynamics is the lead agent for Startup Central Victoria. And the primary focus is in startups. But one of the other things that we're doing is also talking about what is involved to go from that startup to scale up stage. And it's quite often not addressed in policy um, and in gov or in government programs is what are the specific formulas that aren't a guarantee of success, but that tilt the playing field to your advantage. And there's some 101 principles that are, are, are tried, true, and tested. And, you know, unless you happen to read the right book or you happen to come across someone that's done it before, um, you don't know till you've tried and failed yourself. And I think there's an opportunity for us to prevent the rate of failure that's experienced with startups, particularly in the regions, and be able to ensure that they've got some shock absorbers and they're prepared and that we've given them a more explicit pathway that they can travel to that scale-up stage. I think as a, as a founder, I feel like there's two things that I'm always looking for. We have amazing support. You mentioned, Elena, with Startup Shake-Up. There's also you know, being in the regions doesn't mean you're stuck in the regions. You can still access support from Startup Vic and from government and all the rest. But there's two key things that really help you scale, have, would, you know, help me scale at this stage, which is very, you know, only a couple of years. Uh, one is funding. Fund us, invest in us. Uh, if we've proven some, you know, traction, give us some more because it just costs so much to build businesses. Um especially in my world in, you know, in e-commerce. And the second one is um, become our customers. So if, if you can't fund us, then, you know, how can we, um, how can we access a big group of people as customers to kind of get us started? I think those two things, um, they're really hard to do and they always seem to be kind of like putting the two hard basket and we talk about, you know, improving more support for founders and running more education and all these things, which are good. But in the end, when it comes down to is, is cash and customers. So that would be my two cents for those. And this is where the um, gatekeepers are so important, those champions in our communities. And I'm a big fan of the organic um, ecosystem. Uh, every community has them, those people that just instinctively want to help you, want to nurture you, introduce you to the right people. And I keep thinking about the programs that are being run like Startup Shake Up and Startup Gippsland and Startup Centre Victoria is that we can actually scale that process up to get you in touch with the right people instead of just having one champion per rural town we can actually connect a whole region if not read the whole state in regional areas um, to help put you in touch with the right people. And I, I think, Alex, you did get funding. I'm really interested. What, what were the stepping stones that helped you get launched and how did you access them? Um, the first was through university. So we had some um, some of our, my founders are from uh, Swinburne University, so we went through their accelerator. And then we managed to get into the Startmate Accelerator, which is remarkable because they do not care where you are from. <laughs> it's pretty much done virtually. If you can get um, to Sydney or Melbourne or wherever once every couple of weeks or something like that, uh, you know, that's great, but they don't really mind where you are. And so those two programs gave us access to investors. And then I also applied for um, federal and state grants and we, we you know, we were... Um, beneficiaries of some of those so that's kind of how we got going and now you know we also have revenue now and how did you find out about those sources of funding uh when you need funding you do a lot of googling and you kind of figure it out I think um I probably just asked I don't know <laughs> I can't even remember um I guess like probably through 
through uh, Swinburne. They have an innovation. It was called the Innovation Precinct then, um, and they they were sort of the the first people to really kind of coach us into you know, who should we be speaking with? I had a background in finance before I went into engineering. So I kind of understood how investment worked and, you know, how to make your case. So that obviously helped. If you didn't have that background, I think it would have been really you know, even more difficult. Um, and and it could have been quicker again if you'd been, you know, this is where the ecosystems can, you know, fast forward this process yeah. and make it a lot easier. I'm sure you had a lot of late nights doing all that Googling. Yeah, but, I mean, a lot of it was fair. I mean, we're asking people to invest in us. You know, we're not proven. We're high risk. Like, I, I think the funding we got was right for the timing that we had. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not sort of these obscene numbers that you see <laughs> thrown around for some some groups. But, you know, I I think it was we, we've been treated well and um, I, I wouldn't have any complaints about that. Uh, from from our perspective, um, we, we spend a, a lot of time investing in programs and projects. We spend money, uh, sorry, our community bank network. So these are essentially community resources being applied to things like education and support. But but where we're, where our mind is going to now is um, how do we create a more functioning ecosystem? And that that may well be from entrepreneurs, but it's also a more functioning. Um, economic ecosystem, if you like, in some of these smaller communities. So whilst we've been able to, to enable communities to do business with others, government, etc., I don't know that we've done enough work to deliberately say, well, what does the ecosystem look like? Who, who are our anchor institutions? What are our clear priorities to nurture young talent um, on all levels? And how do we create a more functioning ecosystem where that stuff starts to happen more naturally for communities and for participants? Yeah. So, for example, if you want to get funding from anywhere, well, it's a tactical exercise. It's a bit of a needle in a haystack, and it's and it's a real it's there's a real art to doing it. You know, imagine if you could actually package a lot of that up and being really deliberate as a community to say one of the key pillars that we're going to invest in is providing opportunities for young talent to come forward. And, uh, and 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 with their entrepreneurial skills, we don't think there's a shortage of that talent in rural mm. and regional areas. Mm. But how do you create a more functioning ecosystem that might be more formalised? How do you use technology? And how do you place the participant at the start of that whole journey? Right. So that's that's what we're playing around with. We think that is at the moment we can play in the system, but we haven't improved the system to a certain extent. So that's 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 giving you a bit of an insight of what we're looking mm. at as an organisation now. I can say for sure, Colin, that you've improved the system in Bright. Yeah. So Bendigo Bank contributes to a co-working space here um, as a startup shake-up. And uh, this co-working space that I'm in right now has probably 30 members or so from, you know, you, you asked about how do we access accountants. I sit right next door to one. She's working on her business. I'm working on mine. I ask her questions all day. So the, the co-working spaces are really great and connect people across lots of different areas. Uh, and they are kind of these natural hubs where people can get a little bit of that like solidarity, um, a little bit of business advice uh, and kind of can, um, yeah, can, can build those networks within that community. So I think that's a really great prototype to sort of build yeah. on if, you've, if you're looking for case studies, I'm sure yeah. it could be a good one. Well, the other, the other, um, opportunities to share that isn't it to say mm. well okay we're well, working well in bright mm. um, and, and we we do we do a reasonable job of looking at good practice and replicating that or mm. maybe we don't maybe there's an appetite for it we just need to find a way of actually sharing it to say this works for bright it'll work for beechworth and it'll, it'll yeah. work for rochester um because essentially what you're doing is you're bringing talent together and putting them into one spot and enabling that, yeah. that interaction to occur yeah mm. mm. There's sort of two elements, you know, we want to inspire the entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, you know, they find a gap in the market or a problem to solve. So, you know, that they're self-generating, but then how do we help them find their tribe and understand how other entrepreneurs have overcome those barriers and taken up opportunities? So I think, um, you know, sharing the stories is uh, Alex is suggesting a story of how the Bendigo Bank has assisted their community, but it's also sharing the stories of the entrepreneurs um, to to demonstrate, you know, it does happen. There's incredible 
people and groups in the regions that have done very well on the global stage. They're not particularly good at sharing that story. They just do what they do. And I think that's part of our um, opportunities to uh, share those stories a little bit more widely. And um, sadly, that means, you know, asking you, Alex, and other people to come out and talk all the, all the time. Uh, but that's part of giving back to the system and also opening up more channels um, for yourselves. You know, it's finding your tribe. And sometimes that tribe might be either ends of the country, uh, but connected by um, our digital connectivity where we are, it certainly helps us to collaborate in that way. Uh, before we just, uh, I was just wanted to add one more piece to the um, the conversation about particularly funding. It comes up a lot in, in regions. It's actually called the Valley of Death in regional central regional Victoria. There's there's a funding Valley of Death that you're trying to raise anything over a couple hundred thousand to a million. You can sort of get up to about a million bucks within regional Victoria, which is quite rare. Anything a million up to fifty. It's the value of death. It just it never happens. Um, Food Dynamics was very fortunate to cross that chasm. We successfully raised forty million dollars, but it's unheard of. And unless you are, you know, a, a an enterprise within the region, it doesn't occur. And so I, I often get asked, you know, how did you walk on water? How did you perform a miracle? And it comes back to networking. Uh, and if you were if you were to trace the way that we got to doing what no other business has done within our region, it is networking. Now the downside of that is many people aren't like Alex. They don't have the engineering skill and the networking skills. Most entrepreneurs are either good at one or they're good at the other, and quite often entrepreneurs are actually technical people. Quite often they're really um, hands on and you know, may not have focused on developing those networking skills or actually even value them. Um, and so one of the, the key things I would say is, you know, in the executive group that you bring around you, it's having believers that are highly networked that already have their own network around them that they can start going and tapping. And it's 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 really the person that you bring on. It's quite often a second or third or fourth network down that line that winds up being the person or people that invest or become that investor group. And, you know, it's it runs in the parallel, you know. So you, you will see some entrepreneurs that all they're doing is their fundraising. And so what that means is that their innovation and their technology and their differentiator suffers. Or you've got, you know, in the case that when Clear Dynamics started, their founder, highly technical, one in a generation gifted, but hates networking, hates doing that side of the business. And so bringing around him people that were super networkers was the key to being able to walk on water and do what you know never happened within within regional Victoria, let alone regional Australia. Thank, thanks for that, Craig. And it, yeah, it's it's good as far as bringing those advisors and because we've if I can break down maybe some of the, the, the two broad challenges that we've been speaking about. And one of them is around access. So access to networks, access to talent, access to staff, um, uh, things that you might take for granted in a, in a city center. And some of the solutions that came up out of this conversation are things like co-working spaces, having that third space where we can come in here and, and rub elbows, um, uh, providing those examples in order to find out what that looks like, bringing those advisors around you. We also spoke about maybe having a bit of a playbook. I I also want to touch base on the funding because one of the things I found really interesting when I looked at the, the participant, uh, people who signed up for these uh, webinars, the registrants, is funding came up as one of the challenges along with internet and access to markets and a bunch of other things and, and lack of capital, lack of capital, both to fund the ecosystem itself as, as Colin said, are we, are we funding the activities in the ecosystem or am I changing in or the capacity uh, in that, and sustainability in that ecosystem as well as funding for the startups? And it's both. 
Because if I just fund the startups without funding the capacity in the ecosystem, then I'm funding people, as somebody said in the in the chat, just to leave the region. Um, and there's, there's that narrative that comes along. So I want to spend a little bit of time, if we could, please, talking about the capital. Uh, it's good that we have Colin here from a from a banking perspective. We also, also, also obviously there's also angel investment tapping into the high net worth. And the last conversation we had is is tapping into that wealth that's already in the region that may not call themselves angel investors, but still want to give back. And how do we structure that? How do we prepare both sides of that marketplace of founders to be able to have that conversation and the high net worth to be able to have a mature discussion around investing in opportunities? What would that look like? So maybe if I can just open it up to both of those topics of funding for the ecosystem Carrie, I love the concept of your you, but quite often it costs money to bolt all those things onto it, um, as well as funding for the startups themselves. How do we develop that in the region? Because if we don't, then people go where the money is. I, I'm a great believer in if it's important enough, everyone should put in and you know generate uh, that. I don't think it should come from any one source. Uh, if we rely on government to fund everything, then we're in strife because we know that all the innovative great ideas um, originate from communities and that's how our towns and cities were built up in the first place. As Colin said, Bendigo Bank started by the community. Um, you know, a lot of our, our resources have started that way. And, and it does worry me that we get too dependent on government funding. I think it should be a mixed bag and um, we, we need to be able to demonstrate the outcomes so it's not enough just to offer these programs. We really need to measure the impact but it's not a quick fix. And, and um, certainly in government funding, there's an expectation, here's 12 months of funding um, and um, you know what are the, the results? Uh, it's not always that easy because we know that some businesses take, they're a bit of a slow burn to get start up. You know, it could be five years before they get that um, momentum to really drive up to a global market. So we're not going to see the results straight away. And I think the business community gets that. And I've, I've seen a lot of goodwill over the years from the business community to give their time and also their money for those that they believe in. And that's one big advantage that Alex has worked out of belonging to a rural community. If you're part of that community, they will support you as customers and sometimes as investors. And there's certainly some a great wealth out in the rural areas and the regions, the the problem is we don't actually have a network of angel investors in the region that I'm aware of. They tend to do it more discreetly, uh, a bit like the entrepreneurs. You know, quite often like to go it alone. So do the investors. They'll just quietly listen to what's happening, and then they'll tap on the shoulder and say, "I'd like to in, you know help give you a helping hand," which is fabulous. Uh, but how do we make sure that um, everyone's you know got that opportunity and and that's part of the ecosystem building uh, that we need to try and draw those investors, you know, to, to be able to connect them and showcase the startups that are looking for investment. Uh, Kerry, I couldn't agree more. And I'm just looking at you and thinking, you know what, we need more boundary spanners as well, you know, people who can actually work in the margins. And, uh, you know, whilst that's uh, people like yourself, for example, we know that the, the process of community development occurs because we have people who are prepared to work in between the lines, if you like. Um, I also agree with you that that it, we, we must look to ourselves if we want to create a longer-term solution. And part of the problems that we have as society and as communities is we, we think in three-year funding cycles or one-year funding cycles, and that's no way to build community because you need a longer term vision, you need a longer term narrative and you need a sustained effort at the things that are important in those communities. So how do you develop that capability? Um, you know, imagine regional foundations, for example, that had a real specific focus on some of those key opportunities that were interrelated um, that create, if you like, uh, an opportunity for others to invest. Uh, so if you think, well, you know, affordable housing is an issue in Australia at the moment. So what's our approach? Well, it's a longer term approach. Um, the issues of rural mental health, 
uh, we've been speaking about these things for a long time. It requires a long-term approach. Uh, Indigenous disadvantage um, is, is another area that requires a longer-term approach. A and I believe that the answer lies within communities being really well organised, coordinated, knowledgeable and resourced. And, and a lot of that will come from within. And, and so the, the, the challenge for us is how do, we, how do we collect ourselves around the things that are important and then how do we make ourselves investable? Because, um, you know, there's, there's in, the, in, the, in the area of community development, I'm not sure there's a shortage of money. I think there's a shortage of coordination of the money. So, you know, so perhaps the ideal for us is to, is to have this clearly on the agenda um, at a regional level, sub-regional level, and then providing an opportunity for the community, business and others to actually invest in, in a longer term approach. I might just um, jump on and add to that. Something I heard on the news yesterday about, um, and I don't know who the speaker was, but I was listening on the radio, uh, they attributed um, inflation as caused by higher profits. And I thought this is another problem we have in Australia. We tend to um, not celebrate our entrepreneurs as much as we should and, and profit's a bit of a dirty word. Uh, so that's that's something we need to manage and, and perhaps explain a little bit more. Success is really important for our future. And if um, uh, a company does really well, we need to celebrate that because we know it's creating employment and profits that get uh, obviously come back and support our, our system. But, yeah, I, I feel sometimes um, we, we, we're not uh, uh, celebrating our entrepreneurs as, as well as we could, and that's a widespread issue, something we need to work on. Just off the back of that, Kerry, you know, celebrating our entrepreneurs uh, in a more tangible way. So something that the previous um, CEO of Bendigo Bank, who really championed the community bank, Rob Hunt, would talk about often is the triple bottom line. And that's, that's the blast radius across a, a region as a result of investing back within that community from the profits and the capital that successful entrepreneurs and successful businesses are able to achieve. And that's something that the Benigo Community Bank has done extremely well as it is invested back in that community. What, what is critical and what we don't do well is being able to put the metrics around that and be able to communicate that back to the ecosystem, the investment ecosystem within the region itself and broader across Australia. And when we look at those metrics, when we actually unpack and lift the hood on what it is doing to a community's health, its economic health, its um, its social welfare health, the health of um, you know people being able to not just contribute back into their community directly, but also be able to provide guidance for other communities to flourish that uh, that that are nearby, and you know the blast radius is quite extensive. In fact, we have an organisation here in Bendigo called REMPLAN that specialises in regional Australia economic modelling. And for a program that brings in, a government program that brings in a quarter of a million dollars and is investing in training entrepreneurs, the blast radius back into the community is $5 million plus for a quarter of a million dollar investment. And, and that's not just in those businesses growing and employing people and but it's also in those new people that get drawn to the community that are employed in the community because of that new startup and capability and then being able to send their kids to the, the local schools and go to the local restaurants and 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 go to the, the local theater and the, the blast radius across the community becomes exponential. But the problem is because we don't communicate that message and because those those metrics are not put in front of, let's be frank, the bean counters that are quite often involved in being behind the angel investors, then it's not obvious to them what they're investing in and what those benefits are. And so I think there's definitely work, more work to be done in telling the story of not just the successful entrepreneur and not just the successful business, 
but then the blast radius that that has across the whole community, a whole ecosystem. And what that is doing, how that is actually helping federal government and state government um, achieve their decentralization objectives, which every go every government globally is trying to achieve, that decentralization where we've got overpopulation on our coast and we need to be able to decentralize the population for reasons of climate change and, and ecosystem effects. So, you know, I think there's a there's a a story that we can all get behind and contribute to. We'll fix that tomorrow, Craig. Thank you. Elena and I, and yes, we're, we're on to it. There, there, is an opportunity, there is an opportunity in Australia, though, isn't there? I mean, you look at the, uh, the, the words that are coming out of the current Treasurer's mouth um, a number of months ago. He talks about, um, you know, the great shift and, uh, you know, clean energy future and, and uh, redesigning and reimagining markets, for example. Uh, you look also at the recent budget that talks about, you know, place-based collaboration and how we bring philanthropy and, and, and community together in a much more coordinated Way so I think I think there are absolutely I mean the policy is pointing Craig it's absolutely right it's pointing in that direction. Question is you know how do we how do we how do we pick up on that and how do we get on the front foot and put this on the agenda if you like uh, in amongst those those broader engagement um, opportunities which will be complemented I'm sure by another round of regional planning. But it really what it's trying to do is formalise collaboration in a way, isn't it? You know, and it's talk, calling out the importance of place. So there's an opportunity there, I think, for us to think about, well, how do we put this on the agenda through that process? Yeah. I think um, from from my perspective, there's there's some pretty quick wins that could be really helpful. One is partnering with universities. So, so just to be clear, like being away from it all is actually can be a really great thing for a number of reasons. One, rent's cheap. Two, uh, uh you know, you have a little bit of space to kind of think about what you're actually going to do. You don't get swept up in things. So I think that's a really great thing. But I I, I found in building my business that one of the most useful connections was with the universities. It may just be the, the type of business that I have, but access to, you know, prototyping labs, access to experts in those areas, everything from like product design through to like commercialization and IP and things like that. I think universities already have these networks. They're looking, you know, I'm sure they have KPIs for regional involvement. Chad, I'm sure you can talk about this. But um, that could be something that's possibly missing. I think there are university campuses in the bigger in the bigger regional cities, but um, I haven't seen any kind of involvement in the smaller areas. So that, that could be something really interesting worth looking at. Um, don't know. If that's helpful. Oh, that is I'd like to helps. add there is there is something that you've got to Before. consider with funding as well, is that it's not just regional versus city funding. There are a lot of lenses to look at funding from. So, you know, when we look at the state of funding startups in Australia, 85% of funding goes to all male teams, 14% goes to all male teams with one woman, and 0.7% goes to only women run. Um, businesses. And so when you start stacking up these, you know, okay, so you're regional, you're, yeah. you're a woman, um, you know, heaven forbid you make devices that help only women. Um, these, these kinds of lenses are just really useful to think about, not, you know, not that you can necessarily do anything about it, but I think that, you know, that there are a whole lot of kind of sections and, and it's a very complicated area, so it's it's not really any wonder that we're all struggling with it. You know, we haven't even covered Absolutely. like ethnic diversity or anything like that. So, That's I think right. and um, it's just worth you know worth taking a moment and and considering that it is kind of complicated and accessing money is a really hard thing and always has been, probably always will be, and and there's some pretty big um sort of policy things that I think need to shift. And you do see that. You do see like higher higher grant payouts for regional businesses and higher, you know, even having those clauses in those grant programs can be really, really beneficial. I know for like the boosting female founders grant, regional enterprises uh, could access, I think, 70% rather than 50% of the project. You know, stuff like that makes a huge difference. 
Um, yeah, and was, uh, I was just going to say, and Alex, let's just just as a, this is just a throwaway line, Chad. But when you consider the subsidies that go to fossil fuel organisations, you know, the subsidies. Mm, yeah. Even a tenth of those subsidies were given yeah. to regional startups yeah. and regional ecosystems. Yeah. The, the yeah. transformation, the generational transformational effect yeah. it would have yeah. to this country and and any country yeah. would, would be, you know, it, it it would it would shift everything in relationship to being able to foster that innovation for yeah. for a whole country. I think yeah. Craig on that on that challenge we'll have to start wrapping up because we got to. About three, three or four minutes left. Um, what I'd love to do, uh, and Alex, thank you very much for for acknowledging the, the the complexity of it all and and the opportunities. And there there are certain inequalities, but I think they they can be overcome through some of these collaborative approaches. Um, and so, speaking of a collaborative approach, I just want to end. This is a, a road to GEC event, road to Global Entrepreneurship Congress, which is happening in Melbourne. Um, thank you very much, so much for the for the panel of your insights and your wisdom. We are going to be coming together in September to specifically talk about these conversations. The reason why we're having the conversation now is so that we're not coming in cold and fresh when we hit it in September. We actually want to be working on this. Greg, is it the subsidies? Do we start looking at that? Are there policy mechanisms? Alex, how do we raise greater awareness for the, the, the stacked nature of some of these challenges? And how do we get this funding into the, the system itself and not just the, the artifacts in the system? So I'd love to maybe just one really quick around the room, uh, if we can go maybe a, a minute each and just say, look, um, if you're gonna be there in September for the GEC talking about regional challenges, what is something that you think um, would be a benefit in getting together with 4,000 other people of your peers of like-minded to say, how do we address this? Like, what would that look like? And what would you be most looking forward to so that we can help define the program to help actually help solve this? What would you be looking forward to in September for the GEC? Well, probably, um, you know, telling the stories and the metrics. How do we measure and convince the policymakers of where the funding is best spent? And, and obviously to the wider community to, you know, have that surety. So I think, you know, when, when Craig brought up the metrics, uh, that really uh, got my interest. But I think it's also important, equally important to see things on the ground. So I issue a very warm invitation to anyone coming to the GEC. If you've got a few days afterwards, we'd love to see you up in central Victoria. We're actually putting on a, a tour and we're collaborating with Startup Shakeup and our other compatriots to um, bring some speakers on thriving rural towns, on regional enterprises and, and uh seeing firsthand the stories of Clear Dynamics, Bendigo Bank and lots of other innovative um, products and services that have come out of the region. So there's nothing like seeing it firsthand, is there? Thanks for that, Kerry. Craig? Yeah, well, just off the back of what Kerry said is, you know, not just having the message, but then also saying, okay, if we're communicating the pathway, that that enables those outcomes to be achieved so obviously number one the thing that i think we have to address is fully articulating those metrics and, and clearly articulating the benefits to a state to a country to government policy for the objective that they're trying to achieve to get their buy-in and also the, the, the buy-in of investors to, for them to be able to see what the um, social goodwill as well as the economic um, benefits that they potentially can realise. And then it's been able to clearly articulate, let's join together. There are, there are pieces of the pathway to support entrepreneurs. Let's join them together as an enter in delivery mechanism from a policy perspective and from a, from a guidance perspective. And so rather than it be this patch quilt approach where people get a bit of support here, then there's a chasm, then they get a little bit more support over there that we can actually map out that that whole support life cycle to be an insurance blanket for the, for the and, and to foster entrepreneurs to take that risk because we know the benefit that it brings to regions, to a state, to a government's economy, to its triple bottom line, to GDP as a whole. Thanks for that, Craig. Colin, what are we most looking forward to or um, and expect from the GEC? 
unmute. Um, well, first of all, if there's going to be 4,000 participants there, that speaks of the energy and talent and collective intellect that will be one place. And there's always something invigorating about that. So, you know, maybe for me it's it's how you turn this into a bit of a movement to talk, to, to actually deliver on some of the things that Craig actually spoke about. Opportunity and impact. Is it on the agenda and is it not on the agenda potentially because people aren't absolutely aware that this is something absolutely worth investing in? Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, on community infrastructure, et cetera. The, the best thing we can do is actually invest in our talent. Um, so I, I think it's probably an opportunity to raise the movement in terms of its impact and uh, and the opportunity that it presents, particularly to communities and regional communities. So that's probably what I'd be looking at. Excellent. Thanks for that, Colin. Alex, over to you. Uh, I would... I would love to see, selfishly, I would love to be connected in with, you know, the health, uh, health tech network networks. So, you know, if there's if there's four thousand people there, I'd love to meet them, and I'd especially love to meet other regional people in those areas. But I'm not discriminating, uh, so that's really exciting. I think the other the other sort of side would be to see some really good case studies at different stages of building a business for regional areas, who they've tapped into, where, how they did it, um, and just kind of, you know, highlight that journey a little bit. I'm sure we'd see some recurring patterns. And I guess the goal is always to be able to influence influence policy, investment in in research, investment in research and development and commercialisation. Um, and then obviously, you know, if we can sort of get those numbers back up, I think in Australia we have quite low, uh, you know, research and development investment there's a proportion of GDP, so I'd love to see that increase if there's some way to demonstrate that that is worthwhile investment. That would be very cool. So thanks for that, Alex. Uh, and see other people coming in the chat as well as far as building frameworks that encourage collaborative and supportive systems. Uh, everybody in the chat, you'll have all the details from these people as well to share. And Alex, again, just selfishly, there will be a, a startup pitching alley as well. Um, and so we can obviously see what we can do about getting, there'll be heaps of investors there. Uh, so if you're still looking to raise, we can have that conversation as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the panel. Um, you know, absolute honor and pleasure to, to hear your wisdom, um, have a bit of a yarn with you guys. Uh, but I think it's been really productive and, and effective in really articulating some of the challenges, some of the opportunities and getting some, some very clear things. We've got a, a challenge platform that we're going to be putting in place to capture some of these. And also I'll just close on Carrie's point. Um, we are developing an excursion to Centre Victoria into Bendigo. Um, I've heard rumor that there might even be a dinner at the bottom of a gold mine uh, to be able to hear firsthand and see these things, um, to, to live it, to breathe it, to understand, to workshop it, and to share that knowledge. It would be an absolutely amazing post GEC experience. We'll be telling more about that on the website, um, but thank you very much for, for the panelists. Thank you everybody. Uh, for those in attendance and everybody who's going to be listening to this afterwards. Thank you very much and have a great day.